Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning, and I would ask that you turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, as we uh, continue in our series, uh, Life in His Name. Reading through this, uh, this book has been a, a real joy for, for us as a church, and, and I hope that you uh, have, like I have, Try to visualize what it would be like to walk with Jesus in the flesh. And uh, just the, the magnificence of what experiencing that would be like. And I can't help but long for the day when I'm going to get to like physically see him with me, have him with me, and, and uh, what a difference that would make in my everyday life if Jesus was walking with me every day, you know, to be able to see him. You think about all the problems that, you know, we face in our everyday life. You know, you wake up in the morning and, and you're trying to, you know, choose what you're having for breakfast and you say, Jesus, what should I be having today? The healthy choices, Chris. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Well, like, well here's some conflict that's stirring up in, in our family's home. I, I, you know, envisioning, and none of you ever uh, that are married have any type of arguments with your spouse or anything like that, but could you imagine for a moment you're, you're having this uh, intentionally heated discussion and Jesus is in the room and you're like, all right, guys, pause. L- let's work this out. Like, what a, what a great game changer that would be in marriage. Uh, there are so many moments in life that I think I, I long for just that, that practical help. We all need help. Jesus' disciples knew they needed to navigate the spiritual challenges that surrounded them and awaited them in the future. In this ongoing conversation that we see here in chapter 14 this morning, Jesus continues to provide his disciples assurances of God's provision for them, both in the person and work of Jesus, but he shares of a helper who is to come, who's going to help them do great things. And I think this morning it's important for us to realize that God understands we need help. And he understands what a difference it would make to have Jesus in the flesh walking with us moment by moment. But he one-ups that. He does something even greater. He provides us the Holy Spirit. And this morning's big idea is that followers of Jesus experience the helpful assurance of the Holy Spirit's continuing ministry. We're going to find that Jesus assures his disciples of what God is doing and assures them of the things to come, assures them that he's going to send them help, and that help is not going to be different than Jesus' ministry, but a continuation. So let's read together this morning verse uh, 12 through the end of the chapter, and we'll just get some context in 12 and and, uh, unpack this together this morning. And Jesus said to his disciples in uh, verse 12 of chapter 14, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, You will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. And that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, 
and my father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I, uh, I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise. Let us go from here. And let's just pray as we've read God's word this morning. Father, we are so thankful that you loved us in such a way that you sent your son so that he could live a perfect life, die as a perfect sacrifice, and raise from the dead as the perfect conqueror over death. God, we are so thankful that you have not left us alone, but you have sent us help. Help us to be a people who acknowledge our need for help and that we would be a helping people. We pray this in your name. Amen. This passage continues this conversation going on in the upper room. And we've heard Jesus give some pretty direct commands to his disciples. Now, the word of God is filled with all kinds of commands uh, beyond just some of the ones that we are familiar with that sit in most courthouses of the Ten Commandments. Jesus gives some specific commands in the context of the Gospel of John. And I think that when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands, I think that he's really focusing in on on just a a few here in chapter 13 and 14 that we've covered together. Just a couple weeks ago in, in chapter 13, Jesus commanded his disciples to serve one another as I serve you. He washed their feet and demonstrated what it means to be a humble servant willing to lift others up. And so that's a command that he has given to them. He commanded uh, th- them also, as we talked about the, uh, just last week, or sorry, two weeks ago, to love one another as I have loved. The way that I love you, you are to love one another. So serve and love. Those things he has tied together as commands. And then in chapter 14, verse 12, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. So Jesus continues to say very similar things, and they're they're all kind of boiling down to, listen, obey me, trust in me, believe in me. If you believe in me, you're going to do what I ask you to do. You're going to follow my commandments. You are going to live your life as a, a mirage of the life of Jesus. This is his instructions. And so when he says, trust in me, this, this is said over and over and over and over again. Look at verse 15 of 14. It says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you believe, if you, if you know that I am for you, that I have come to save and redeem you. And then later on in verse 21, he, he echoes this same sentiment. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And this is a great question for us to ask ourselves. Do I love God? Do I love God? And the evidence of your life is the answer to that question. If you love God, you won't fear obeying his commandments. You will know that they are for your benefit. You will know that they are a picture of heaven, as we talked about last week. An eternal perspective allows us to serve and love freely, knowing that just like Jesus came to earth to love, it cost him. And to love one another, it will cost us something. But it's worth it. 
It's eternally worth it. And obeying God is also worth it. We cannot be a people who pick and choose how we will obey God. Some of the commandments that God gives throughout his word, they feel easy to some of us, or they seem natural, or they might even seem to make sense. And then there's commands that you might be frustrated with. You don't like that one, or you struggle to obey that one. You are in good company. Life is lived so that we can understand God's love for us in eternity. And as we live our lives now, they can reflect our hope of eternity and our love for God. When we love God, we obey him. And we must be a people if we are to say, I am a follower of Jesus, that I'm going to follow all of who he is and all of what he has said. If you look at verses 20 through 25 in in chapter 13, briefly with me, uh, he articulates this pretty well. Uh, He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. This is this uh, understanding that we're going to talk about next week about abiding in God. That if you obey God, disciples that are truly disciples of God, they have union not only with Jesus and God, but with the, the Holy Spirit. And so we believe in one God as three persons. We call him the triune God. And so disciples have union with the triune God. And God is so kind to us in how he has decided to manifest himself to us because he knows that we need diversity of how things are communicated and how we receive care because we're a diverse people. And so Jesus communicates the help that is coming. And I love how he, he, he does this because our Savior not only understood our need for encouragement, but he also sent us the best possible helper the greatest helper in all of history. Not just one person who's stuck and limited to being in the flesh, but someone who is everywhere at all times, all-knowing. So every single person can be helped by the Spirit at any given moment, at any given time. And Jesus, he alludes to the great things that the disciples are going to be able to not only experience, but they're also going to do. In verse 12 of chapter 14, it says, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, right? These commands, they're going to serve, they're going to love, they're going to trust in God. And then he says, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. This this implication that is going on here, greater works than these, are the disciples going to be better than Jesus? No, but God is going to uh, do some amazing things in just a short uh, period of time from where they are now in this upper room when Pentecost happens. If you read the book of Acts, Jesus ascends into heaven. The Holy Spirit uh, comes down upon the disciples and they begin to preach and teach and tens of thousands of people come to salvation and the church is formed. And numerically the type of growth that they saw because of the Holy Spirit completely outshined the followers and the following that Jesus had. And so he knew that God is going to do something amazing in the building of his church, in the establishment of his church to minister not only to more people than Jesus could interact with his life, but through generation after generation after generation. And this great thing they can look forward to. But in order to love God and follow his commandments, you can imagine the disciples feeling this sense of tension of we've, we've seen politically how things are shaping out. There are people that are after you. There are people that wish to do you harm. And there are people that don't like what we're teaching and what we're about. They feel threatened by us, they're offended by us, and they wish to do us harm. And you're telling us you're about to go to heaven and leave us here? I can understand their fear and trepidation. So Jesus, again, in his loving kindness to them, he assures them. When you think about 
uh, parents, is you, you have your child that comes to you in the middle of the night because they had a scary dream. And you just got to remind them of what's real and what's not real. And, and, and just assure them of truth. Daddy's here. You are safe. That was just a dream. This is your reality. And you kind of let them come to for a moment. And Jesus does this here. It just gently assures them, reminds them. And we could think back through some of the things that we've seen just in chapter 14. And in verse 14, verse 3, he said, I, I go and I prepare a place for you. Be assured there's something waiting for you. There's a nice spot that I have built for you in heaven. And then he tells them, greater works than these are you going to do. There's good things to come. You're afraid of the moment, but remember, the best is yet to come. And then he says, I will ask the Father, and I will give you another helper. I think that this is uh, a moment for us just to camp out on in verse 16, to understand what he's talking about here, that he's going to give you another helper. Uh, This word in the original language, it it really could mean advisor or intercessor. A lot of times it's used in a a legal sense that, you know, almost like a counselor, somebody who's going to kind of be there for you to kind of provide you the legal guidance that you need. Here, the the, uh, the context really implies more that he's, he's a comforter that he's going to help, that he's going to strengthen or even console. And when you think through what the disciples are about to face as they embark on being ambassadors of Christ, knowing that they're going to need help in that mission, Jesus knows that they're going to need to be strengthened because there's moments when they're going to feel weak, that they're not going to be able to continue on. And he knows that there's going to be moments where they're going to feel discouraged or defeated or even watching some of their uh, peers being hunted down and then brutally murdered. They're going to need comfort. God knows this and sends a helper like this. And Jesus, when he says another, this word in Greek is usually one of two ways. It's usually uh, heteros, which means another of a different kind. So if I were to say, hey, I I got you all apples and um, I gave you, you know, everybody on the way out, you can have a golden delicious apple, but we ran out for, so for some of you, you're not getting an apple, uh, you're going to get another kind of gift, and it's, it's a, a teddy bear, okay? Those are very different things, right? You can't eat a teddy bear, all right? Completely different, but what he says is, I'm giving you another like me, so the word alos is another of the same kind. So I left you golden delicious, when we run out, you all get Macintosh, all right? And so, same apple, you can do the same thing, it's different. And so Jesus is implying here, look, you have experienced the help that I've provided you. You've experienced the healing that I've done, you've experienced the teaching that I've given, and you have seen the love and care and attention that I have for you, a lost and dying people. And so you've experienced that help. I'm going to send you the same kind of help anticipate that, trust in that. And to help us understand this a little bit further, I asked a couple men in our church to help me. So I'm going to ask if Isaac and Rob would come up here. And uh, over here, I've got a couple uh, hundred pound dumbbells. Each of them are a hundred pounds. And when you lift, uh, it is always good practice to to lift with somebody else. Because uh, when you are lifting heavy weights, what happens is as you get to so many reps, uh, your muscles start to kind of like give out, you lose strength. And so you need a spotter. You need somebody there because your muscles eventually, they can't lift it. So I'm a visual person. I'm a visual learner. So I wanted us to think through like how we are spiritually navigating life, needing help. And so Rob is going to try to lift. Each of these are 100 pounds. So, uh, and this is great. You see he's wearing a security shirt. This is the strength of the security team protecting you all. And so he's going to get these up. But in order to get them up, he needs Isaac here to help him. Because he can't. Can you get these up by yourself? No. Okay. All right. Perfect. So he's going to go and let's see how many reps can you get in here. Well, right. He gets them above his head. I was like, that's 200 pounds up there just in, on each arm. Right. And so he gets to a point that he needs a helper. He needs somebody to spot him. Now, this is also really hard because there's no back support. There's no like bar. So not only does he need Isaac's arms, but he needs his knees to support his back. All right. Let's give Rob a round of applause. Thank you. 
if he tried to do this on his own, maybe he could lift some weight, right? Maybe he could get up there and be like, you know what? I'm confident. I got this. I'm going to do it on my own. But he's really setting himself up for hurt and failure because eventually his muscles give out. Eventually, he could really get crushed by the weight of what he's trying to, to, to accomplish. And the disciples, they're about to face that. They're going to go and they're going to have a responsibility. They're going to have a life that they're going to try to live. And if we try to do that on our own, we can get crushed by the insurmountable uh, uh, task of living a life for God. It's hard, especially because we are still people who are struggling with the flesh. We're still waging war with the things that are, are going on within us naturally or carnally. We need help. We need that Holy Spirit to come and say, you're not alone in this. I'm going to help you accomplish this. I'm going to help you grow in that strength. But don't be so prideful that you think, I can do this on my own. Because you know what might happen? Is you might try to do something on your own, and that weight is going to crush you. And you're going to give up. You're going to be like, I'm done. It's just not worth it. Or you're going to get injured and say, I, I, you know what? I'm never doing that again. And I have seen people who have tried to live their lives to serve God, and they're so prideful that they just try to do it on their own. And then they experience some really difficult spiritual hurt. And you know what happens? Because they did it on their own, I'm done. It's not worth it. I don't want to. They got crushed by that weight. Jesus is giving us another kind of helper. And so if we look in verse 26, he says again, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to you a remembrance all that I have said to you. The ministry of the Holy Spirit teaches, he comforts, he corrects when we need it, or even convicts. This is the assurance that we have somebody who is here to help us navigate life. I need help. I need correction. I need support. I need comfort. And God knows that. Jesus gives them another assurance. If you look at verse 18, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. You think through uh, how significant spiritual uh, heritage is to the people of Israel, and, and they talk about the fathers of their faith, and there's all this beautiful lineage, and they, they see all of these heads of, uh, of history, whether it's Abraham or Moses or David, and, and they go through and they see there's all of these champions of the faith who have been spiritual fathers for us, and, and they've let us be part of this holy nation, this family. We are, we are a people that are called and protected and provided for and blessed. And so they're experiencing, again, all of that in the person of Jesus, very different than what spirituality had morphed into with the Pharisees. And so they're concerned, like, you're going to leave us, and now we're going to be spiritual orphans. He said, no, no, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And I love that. He's saying, this, I'm coming to you, I'm going to leave you the Spirit. The Spirit is going to continue to let you feel and experience what it's like to be part of God's family. Let's think through the contrast of this for a moment. An orphan has parents who are dead or who have abandoned them. The Spirit shows us that Jesus and God the Father are alive. An orphan is left alone. The Spirit draws us closer to the presence of God. An orphan has lost their provider, but the, the Spirit continues to provide. It continues to teach, continues to comfort, continues to correct. An orphan has no defender. The Holy Spirit demonstrates that God is still our protector. Be assured that Jesus wants you as part of his family. The length that he has gone so that you can experience what it's like to be in that family is nothing short of glory. He says other things. Because I live, 
you also will live. How comforting must that be hindsight? When this gospel is being written, they have already seen these events play out. They already know that Jesus died and then raised from the dead. Paul says things like, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Because of what Jesus does. And so they don't have to fear death anymore because Jesus says, look, I'm the master of that. I rule over that. You don't have to be afraid. And then he says, the helper will teach you all things and bring you remembrance. Remembrance. Because you know what? I, I can tell you that over all of my education, there's so, I've forgotten more than I have uh, learned, I feel like, most days. And I have all of these great notes that I go back and, and, and I look through from my undergraduate or my graduate work, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I totally forgot about this. Or this really great nugget that a professor had said and I written down back in, you know, almost 20 years ago. And I look back at those now, and I'm like, thank you, God, for, for being able to kind of bring this to my remembrance. I need help because I forget things. I forget even how things work. Uh, yeah, I was just helping a friend recently um, switch out their washer and dryer and it took me a moment because I had done that plenty of times myself but you you haven't done it in a while and they're like oh yeah how does this connection work I gotta you know and we so we had done all the wiring and uh for the electrical components and I by the time we finished I realized that we hadn't run the rest of the wire through the little hole that goes on the side so you can put the cover over it so we had to undo the whole thing just because I had forgotten that step. I'm like, oh, I forgot. It's right in front of me. I remembered that. And every time I've done, I'm like, don't forget to do that the right, the way, the right way the next time. This is the, the, the help of the Spirit. He's going to help you continue on in the things that you have already learned from God. His ministry is one that is continuing. And so Jesus' ministry is going to continue through the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's so comforting because it helps us understand uh, how the Spirit works, what is from the Spirit or what might be from ourselves. You see, the Spirit's not going to contradict Jesus. The Spirit's not going to contradict the Word of God because it's a continuation. Sometimes we get caught in this trap and we, we maybe want to uh, pursue new revelation. And I, I tell you, listen, Work on just obeying the revelation that God has given us. And once we can do that, then, then maybe we'll ask for, some, for, for the next stuff. Obey God. We're sitting here saying, oh, I want a new word. I want a special word from you, God. And, and, and we, maybe we get all mystical with how the Spirit works. And we miss out on he is rooted in the person of God. Now, the other, pendulum swings on the other side of that. A lot of times... We ignore the Spirit. A lot of times, maybe the Bible warns us not to quench the Spirit. And we do that by being of the world. John helps us understand this when he, he warns that the world can't receive him. If you look back to verse uh, 15, 16, we'll read, I will give you another helper to be with you forever, which is so comforting. Then he says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. The world is not going to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit because they are so busy thinking about their own things. They are thinking about things that are not holy, but spiritually dead they are fixated on their own self-assurance brothers and sisters don't be naive to think that you too can't be overly confident in what you think you know and sometimes we do this even as bible students even as 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 men and women who want to study god's word and the bible tells us to be good bereans where we we really try to understand it but the Bible also says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your paths. Are we acknowledging God, the spirit, and are we allowing him to help us live our lives? Or are we saying, you know what, spirit, I, don't, I can ignore you because I got this, I'm good. I'll understand it on my own. 
And I can tell you that there are plenty of people who think they really understand God's word and they miss the mark. And I can be confident that I can confess to you that I have been confident in my understanding of God's word and I have missed the mark. I know a lot about God and his word and yet I choose not to obey his commandments. You see the irony in that? Or I'm confident in my theology, and so then what happens is my attention moves from worshiping God to worshiping my knowledge of God. And then that becomes an idol. Let us be a people that have the healthy tension of of obeying God, knowing that the Spirit of God doesn't contradict His Word, but also being a people that say, I know that I need help. I know that I'm going to wake up and say, Holy Spirit, help me. I'm struggling to obey his commands today. I'm struggling to to serve. I don't want to. These people are difficult. They're frustrating. It's like I'm saying the same things over and over and over, and it's not getting through, Lord. Why do I have to do it? Help me, Spirit. This isn't what I want to do. I need to obey. Help me to love. Sometimes they feel unlovable. Love is costing me time and energy and, and emotions. Continue on. Continue to do it. Holy Spirit, help me. And Lord, we, write, we said this early on in, in this series. We, we set the stage looking just a few chapters before uh, or beyond this that there are people that said, Lord, help my unbelief. Spirit, I am struggling today. The evidence around me, I feel the story that I'm telling myself is that you're not working, but you are. Help me to trust that. Help me to believe that. Help me to, 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 to trust you even when I don't see it. Help me to obey even when I don't feel like it. We need the ongoing, continuing work of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. You see, we look at life and we have plenty of things to be troubled about, like we said last week. And Jesus echoes the same thing that he said to them at the beginning of chapter 14. He says again to them in verse 27. He says, These things I have spoken to you a while. I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things to your remembrance that I have said to you. And then he says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And this is a very common uh, greeting or uh, even, you know, like a goodbye in uh, Jewish culture. Shalom. But how he uses it here is different. He's saying both goodbye and hello in the the same sentence. That's kind of how they use it for both. But he's not saying just like goodbye. He's saying God's peace I give to you. I peace I leave with you. And then he, he he shows the contrast of this. Look at verse 27 again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is really important for us because sometimes the world, when they want peace, sometimes really what peace feels like, uh, the world means, is they want control. The world says, you get peace when you're in control. And you want to be in control of your life because then you can control all the variables in that. I don't, I'm not going to get hurt. I'm not going to get offended. I'm going to only have people that I like in my, you know, my world. And I can control you know, how everybody plays and interacts. God says, no, my peace is different. My peace is one that you get to surrender. That you get to let go of all the fear because there's a God who's in control. And there's a God who's here to help and to bring about his will, not ours. And so in the midst of a troubled life, Jesus' peace allows us to have an untroubled heart. You can rest assured that God is at work. You can rest assured that he has gone to prepare a place for you. You can rest assured that greater works are to come. You're going to experience greater things. You can rest assured that you aren't being left as orphans, but you are part of God's family. 
And you can rest assured that even if you die, you will live because God is alive. Let not your hearts be troubled. Our helper is like Jesus. Jesus is just like the Spirit. He comes alongside us. He encourages us. He exhorts us. Sometimes when we get into the muck, picks us up, dusts us off, and he gets us going again. Let's lean on our helper as a church. And as we lean on our helper, we will be a people that glorify God, love people, and make disciples. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you're not done working. We're thankful that we can trust you and that you're worthy of that trust. Lord, help us to be a people that lean on you. Help us not to try to carry the weight of life on our own, that we would be crushed or injured or maimed, but Lord, that spiritually that we could grow in strength in endurance and in character and in hope. Thank you so much for the way that you love us. Help us not to forget your grace. We pray this in your name. Amen.